Um, I don't actually have a speaker. I'm holding this mic so that uh, we can live stream this event. It's on being uh, live streamed on YouTube. And uh, so we do have two mics uh, on each of the front chairs, which uh, if you're speaking, um, we can bring it to you or you can come up. Um, and uh, really excited about the turnout. My name is Alana Blanchard. I work in the city manager's office. I'm managing this project for the city. Um, we're calling it Sobu's Faces 2020 Engage because 2020 is when this building is proposed to open, meaning it will open. And I say proposed only because there is a lot of approvals, but that is um, the schedule that we're working with. Uh, and it's to create a library and city hall in one uh, building on one site. Um, I wanted to introduce uh, Jennifer Murray in case you have not met her before, although you all should have. Uh, she's the library director. Um, and if the Board of Trustees could stand up, um, they've worked diligently towards um, uh, uh, highlighting the need for a library in this community and have uh, worked very hard um, on moving this project forward. And I really appreciate the uh, work that they've done. Um, and then there's a few folks who are on the foundation uh, or on a library advocacy committee, and if they could stand up too. Um, and then uh, I'm sort of here representing City Hall, so <laughs> as is Donna. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and to some degree, all of you, because it's your building. So I'm going uh, and I'm going to go through and I'm, I'm going to introduce the team that will be working with you on this project in a moment. Um, and do you, do you have an introductory slide also? Uh, just, just after you. Okay. Uh, so, you know, I know that the library feasibility study was first done in 2006. We redid it in 2013. Uh, we also started looking at a program for City Hall um, and looking at recreation needs. Um, we uh, continued um, to talk about the need for a library. The library engaged in visioning exercises um, and started the Library Make Some Noise campaign. So there's been a big effort um, to understand what a library is and what the needs are um, and where this community is going in that respect. Um, so last summer, we were able to um, get a property owner to agree to um, give us an option on their land. Um, and so, and I'm gonna, and so we have an option on about a half an acre in the heart of city center on Market Street, just south of the Rick Marcotte Central School um, and east of Allard Square, the new building, senior housing that is going in on Market Street. Um, and, uh, and the area to the east of that is owned by Snyder Braverman, which have just completed um, their major environmental permits for that site. Uh, and then just, oops. Can I get you to step on the other side of the screen, please? Sorry. Can you be there or on the other okay, side? I'll be on the other side. <coughs> there you go. Um, uh, all right. And I just wanted to point out this is the entrance to the Rick Marcotte Central School. It's right here currently. In the future, it will be on a new street. Uh, so, this is our standard process for um, public projects in the TIF district. Uh, we start with the project kickoff workshop, which is this week. Um, there's a purpose and need that's uh, developed and adopted by the Planning Commission, and in this case, the Library Board of Trustees. That will occur in February. Um, and then there are alternatives presented for review. That will occur in March. They will be tested against the purpose and need, but also given to you um, for comments on uh, and feedback. Um, and then in this project, we're doing something a bit special. We're also bringing immediately after the alternatives, once one is recommended by the architectural team, they will then present it to you again the following week on Tuesday. Um, and so then in April, once the cost estimate is complete, um, the project will be presented to the city council for endorsement and moving on to the next step, which is design. Um, so this is the outreach plan for this project. This is the whole schedule. Uh, it uh, obviously begins now. Um, it will be, uh, the, so you can see the city council meeting right at the beginning. Uh, voting will be in November 2018. 
for a construction start in March of 2019, opening day in April of 2020. So there you go. That's it. We're, we're almost there. <laughs> um, and we're gonna we're gonna hang on for, for questions. I'm gonna let um, Dennis take all the questions. Um, and so, uh, so and then this is my last slide. So stay in touch with us. Um, we're going to be putting up a survey, uh, and we're going to be asking some of the same questions that we asked today. We may be asking other questions. We'll be putting our material up there, um, and you can get to it by www.southburlingtonvt.gov. And I will, and so there will be a link from our main page. It's going to go through the blog, so go through until you get to a page that has a lot of questions about the project and a lot of answers. If you don't feel like you're having getting enough answers, keep clicking through and you'll get to it. Um, but all the pages will be about the, we'll put the most recent information at the front, but you may have to go in to get the whole project page. So that's it. Um, I'd like to introduce the design team. Um, it's led by Steve Roy. He's a South Burlington resident. We had a long, intensive uh, request for qualifications, very competitive process. We had eight teams um, submit their qualifications, um, at least, and uh, we narrowed it down to four. Um, and they, um, by far, blew everyone out of the water um, by th with their team. So they are very strong in sustainability, and they partnered with a team that is extraordinarily strong in libraries. Dennis Humphrey is at the back of the room, um, uh, bringing a chair over to somebody, uh, has worked on a ton of libraries. So we're really excited to have them here, and I'm going to give the mic to Steve. Uh, thank you, Alona, and thank you, everybody, for coming out here today. Um, I appreciate the words of Alona, but it takes it, it really takes a large team of, of people to put a building together. Uh, but it takes a large group of, of members of the city to, to help make that building something that's special. Uh, and that's why we're here tonight and uh, again on Saturday. Uh, it's really to, to gather feedback. We want your opinions, uh, regardless of... Uh, where you stand on the issue. We have uh, a presentation that Dennis is going to go through, um, and there's a series of boards that, that ideas can be posted onto. So we really uh, want you to participate uh, and, and allow your voice to be heard. Uh, our team is Weeman Lamphere Architects, and we are with Humphreys Poly Architects. Um, beyond these two names is a series of uh, special designers and, and members of the team that, although they're not here tonight, are, are really a key part of getting this project where we need to in the end. Um, we want to create a livable community through buildings that ennoble the site, inspire the participants, sustain the resources, and bring joy to the users. Um, part of bringing joy to the users is knowing what brings joy to the users. And we can fill in a lot of blanks, but it's nice to find something special about South Burlington that can really make it a unique building. Uh, Weeman Lanphier is a 46-year-old company. Uh, we've, we have a long history. Uh, I am the vice president along with my uh, older brother who is the president. Uh, we're kind of the third generation of partners that are creating kind of a Weeman Lanphier that uh, is forward-thinking, more sustainable, uh, and really looking to make our projects something special. Um, this is one of our latest projects, which um, is kind of a demonstration piece for us. It's, it's been uh, received multiple awards for its design, its construction, and its sustainability. So it's a project that represents the types of elements that we want to, to, to bring to the city of South Burlington as well. Um, just a few uh, views of, of that building in particular. <laughs> there we go. Uh, it, it also includes, includes uh, performance spaces and types of spaces that may be uh, useful and pertinent to uh, the building that we're proposing. This is also a building that uh, is essentially a public building and people can take tours uh, and visit any time. So it's, it's an opportunity for you to see um, you know, that type of work um, and experience. 
Uh, I'm going to pass it off to Dennis Humphreys now. He's the principal at Humphreys Poly Architects. And um, he's from Denver, Colorado, and uh, really can do some special library work. Uh, and that's, that's why he's here. Thank you. Get the clicker. There we go. All right, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. It's an honor to be working with Steve and his firm, and, and um, in particular, the designing a new library and civic center City Hall for you all. Um, as you can see, our, our, our libraries come in all sizes, shapes, and forms, and uh, we've worked on over 90, but there are no two that are alike. We always try and find out what's so special in that community. And I'm gonna show you tonight a bunch of images of libraries from around the world, some that we've designed and some that uh, we've not designed. Um, and we're gonna wanna try and get a sense of what you might like in, in terms of the library for South Burlington. Um, sometimes I show things to people in communities and they say, oh, we don't want anything like that. And that's what we're here to find out, is <laughs> what you don't want. Yes? When you point out the libraries, can you point out which ones are a combination civic center or library? Sure. I, I, will, I will try to do that. I will uh, tell you that a majority of what I'm going to show you are libraries but we are gonna talk about some city hall uh, civic combos. Yes, okay? So um, all of you should have these post-it notes, all right? So this is how you're gonna communicate with us tonight. Um, and we have plenty more, so if you need some, we have them, or if you need a writing utensil, we have those as well. Um, these are kind of like the old-fashioned uh, form of tweets. <laughs> So we're, we're using paper tonight, but because there's only so much room, you can only write so much. However, it's great to see some young uh, folks here because you can draw and show us pictures of things you like. And I noticed that there are a number of these uh, post-it notes back there. Uh, so the idea is I'm gonna ask you to write down what you like and what you don't like. And if for some reason, uh, so you write one idea down per, per sheet and then you go to the next one and you go to the next one and um, when we get done with all of these you need some more we'll do that and, and in about in, um, 45 minutes we're going to get up and we're going to put them on the white paper in the back of the room okay so we're going to go pretty fast um, we've been very fortunate we work with some great clients libraries are very exciting projects and our, our projects have been uh, on the cover of Library Journal Magazine, which is the professional magazine of the, of the professional, of the library profession. Uh, one of the libraries that we did that was very revolutionary is called the Anythink Libraries. And they were very bold, and that they were one of the worst performing libraries in the country, and they decided they had nowhere to go but up. So they threw out all the rules, changed everything, and uh, it's a very exciting uh, series of libraries uh, in Colorado. Um, and then we also, um, I may have to run over, there we go. Uh, this is uh, in Louisville, Colorado, uh, a library in a historic district, um, a two-story library with, with parking below grade. Uh, this was the transformation of a corporate uh, office building into a library that was honored as one of the top libraries in the country uh, about four years ago. And then not all our libraries are big and not all our libraries have great budgets. Uh, we didn't have any money for landscaping on this one, but we thought it was okay because this is facing the, on the west face of the Grand Teton in Wyoming. So um, um, I kind of call it the one, one room schoolhouse, but it's a library. So a uh, very special place. Um, they actually have cross a Nordic Center um, that is part of the library. Uh, so it's in the mid midst of the Nordic track. So I this is a quote by an Italian architect that talks about why we're doing this. And you know, if you go back and you think about the, if you've traveled to Italy or to Europe, you think about all the wonderful things that were planned a number of years ago and all the great spaces that are there. And it's because somebody took the time and effort to, to plan out the city. And so that's what we're doing today. We've got this great opportunity to create this city center with a new library and a city hall. And so we wanna make sure that we do it right so that the future generations will look back on us and say we did the right thing. 
So this is the other reason we do it, uh, is that, you know, in today's world, the library is uh, the most trusted institution in the country in terms of, you know, if you want a resource, you want something, you call the reference librarian or you call the library and you ask and you will, you'll, you'll get the information. It's not on the internet all times as we know. So um, what we believe is that there, there's a, a, a time now where libraries are more relevant than ever. Many people think that they're not, people aren't coming to the library because we don't need to come get books. However, statistics are starting to show that the younger generation has a much, much stronger affinity to the hard book than, than my generation. We also know that people are coming to the library for multiple reasons beyond just books. And so uh, they're using their services and programs more than ever, and our communities are gonna continue to change and libraries are gonna remain very, very important. We like to think that libraries are like Starbucks, a place for the community to come together, to make social connections. You don't have to buy the coffee, but the most important thing is anybody can use it. Anybody and everybody can come to the library and use the resources. So it's such an important public institutions. And so what we like to think is that uh, libraries are shifting from being a warehouse of books to becoming what we call a participatory learning organization. In other words, it's a place where you can come and do things and not just get a book and walk out, go home, but it's a place where you can come and do things. And I'm gonna show you lots of examples of that in the presentation tonight. Um, so this is a real quick a timeline. I know you can't read it, but the idea is that a number of years ago in 1850s, where we start here up to today, library services have grown and grown and grown, and they're gonna continue to grow and offer more things. The original libraries were founded on books and maps and then newspapers and magazines, and then it's just exploded in the 1900s and, and 2000 in terms of all the things that you can get at the library. So it's just, as you know, a very important institution in our, our community. So I'm sure you all had dinner, <laughs> but I wanna, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I wanna tell you a short story because this is what I want you to do tonight. I want you to think about the library in a totally different context than what you may think today. So a young mother and her daughter were making meatloaf and as they, they prepared the meat and were gonna put it in the oven, the mother cut the end off just like this. And the young daughter said to the mom, why did you do that? And she said, I don't know, my mother did it that way. Well, let's call grandma. So they called grandma and they said, grandma, why do you cut the end off the meatloaf? Grandma said, I don't know, that's how my mom taught me to do it. So they called great grandmother and asked great grandmother, um, great grandmother if um, why she cut the end off the meatloaf. And great grandmother responded, well, that's silly. My pan wasn't big enough. <laughs> so for several generations, they had been cutting the end off the meatloaf for reasons that were no longer relevant. So when we start thinking about the library, we want you to take the blinders off and I want you to think about what it could be. Not what it is today, but what it could be and what it could be in this community. So um, one of the first things I, I wanna talk a little bit about is I know that there probably are some cherished things in either the existing city hall or library that are important. And you know, not being from South Burlington, it's important that I understand this. So if there were one thing there are one space that you like in the library, and I know the library just moved, but if there's one thing that's very special, I want you to write that down on a post-it note, okay? One thing. These first several questions are very, very simple. It's just one word, one thing. So if there's something that you like, you like the way uh, you enter the building, you like the way the children's area is at the library, you like the way the council chambers are today. You like anything of that sort.
So the next one is, I'd like to know one word that best describes South Burlington. So one, one word on, that best describes South Burlington. We're going to put it on a page back there. Um, I asked this question this morning with the library staff, and they said cozy, confused, <laughs> opportunities. I mean, there is no right answer. I just want to get it from you, because it, it'll come back, and we'll understand very clearly what, what the objective is. Yes, yes, always separate post-its. So feel free, we, we have a lot here. So the next question is, what is your favorite place in South Burlington? Now it could be Red Rocks, could be the mall. A lot of people respond to this question when you ask them home, uh, which is fine. But we're just trying to get an understanding of if you were to put South Burlington, some people might say friendly, outgoing, <coughs> maybe confused. I don't know. Uh, confused is not necessarily a negative reference. It's just meaning that, oh, did I move it? Oh, there we go. Thank you. All right. So we're going to talk just a little bit about what has happened in libraries in the last a um, few years, and most of us think about, uh, you know, the traditional library, uh, the Carnegie libraries, where it was a very formal process of going to the library. It was, you could not talk, and the books and knowledge, it was, it was where everything was, because we didn't have the internet, obviously. But let's, let's step forward to, um, the 1980s, and I always like to associate things that happen in libraries with fashion and music and things like that, just to keep, keep things moving. But in the 1980s, one of the big concepts in library was compact shelving, because it allowed us to put twice as much stuff in the library as what was there before. And so it was a very popular thing. However, no one could get it. <laughs> but we could get more, more books, more material in the library. In the 1990s, the internet started to evolve. Uh, Netscape was actually a search engine that 97% of all searches were done on Netscape, and today it's like maybe two-tenths of a percent how things change. But we also had interlibrary loan starting. So you could get a library book from anywhere in the country just by going through inter interlibrary loan. In 2000, we had a lot of competition from the big box bookstores. And we also had the advent of the desktop computer. And so it changed the landscape in the library altogether. And now the libraries are still here, and many of the big box bookstores are no longer, although you do have a couple of Barnes and Nobles in the area that are, seem to be doing quite well because they're adapted. But uh, things have changed. So, and then 2010, um, we started getting away from the desktop computers and go to tablets, iPads. This is a 3D printer, which we find in many libraries where people are doing fabulous things using 3D printers. Uh, so it became more digital, more technologically oriented. And that's when we thought the books were going to go away. Well, in Today, we find that libraries are focusing on people, on the community, on, still on technology, but books are very, very important. So the pendulum has kind of come back, and that books are still a very important resource in our libraries. So with that, this is the last one word question. But I want you to write down one thing that you can do in the library. And one thing that you think the library is there for. And while you're writing that down, I'll show you uh, a list that we've gotten from other uh, presentations like this. And you can see that some of the normal thought processes of reading a book, doing homework, access information, we all know about that. There's a library where you can drink wine. <laughs> 
But some of these really powerful things like change the world. Did you know that? You can go to the library and change the world? Sure. You can learn new, a new language. You can uh, learn a new skill. You can start a business. There's all kinds of really wonderful things that you can do at the library, and that's why we're here to talk about how we're going to build this building to facilitate that. So people always ask me, well, what's the difference of a 21st century library? And I say, well, these are the four ingredients that it must have great experiences, and we all can remember the experiences as a youngster going to the library, that it is empowering, that you can learn some new skills, you can become a stronger person, you can do something that's innovative, start a business, create an invention, and it's involvement, where you can come together as a community and do things differently. And then we add on to that these other four words that we think are essential. Is one is flexibility. We know technology is going to change, and so we have to be design a building that's nimble enough that can adapt itself to these new technologies, et cetera. Collaboration is a big concept. Sustainability, not only from an environmental sustainability, but we want to design it so it has minimum resources of staffing and things like that. So we're not creating a new library that's going to be burdening the future taxpayers of South Burlington because it, it takes too much staff to run. We also want it to reinforce creativity. This is what a 21st century library is all about. It's not about the number of books. It's not about the number of computers. It's about reinforcing these four primary concepts with the secondary concepts in mind. So we're going to start talking about slides. I'm going to go very, very fast. I will try and identify some of the, the uh, libraries. Um, and there may be times when I just throw out a word, and you can write that word down, and we'll figure out where it goes, OK? So we're going to talk about civic engagement, because we're talking about a city hall and, and a library. We're talking about a civic center. And so we all know that typically, you know, when we start talking about public engagement, a civic center, it's a place of celebration. It's a place to gather. Um, but in, more importantly, uh, in today's world, and I'm sorry, there we go. This is a library in Denmark that you can see that there's a small space outside the library where people have gathered on the stair. So it becomes almost like uh, an auditorium or an amphitheater. And you see it's a very popular place. Uh, but all these spaces do not necessarily have to be that formal. They could be informal in terms of the types of gathering spaces, whether it be for a musical program, for some celebration of the city or town, et cetera. Or it could be a room like this, where it's very flexible, the tables can be moved, things of that sort. Uh, to allow for the engagement of the community in, in their discussions. Uh, this is that library in Denmark, and what I, I really think is, is special about this is this is in the very center of the, of the library, and this, I call this a gong, so it's a, a, a metal object that's hollow in the inside, and every time a child is born in this town, the mother in the hospital is given an iPad, she pushes a button, and the gong sounds. <laughs> and so every child coming into this town, their lives, the beginning of their lives are celebrated. And that happens as a part of civic engagement. It doesn't have to be at a library, it could be in the city hall. What can we do here to have that kind of celebration in this building that we're designing for you? I'm not suggesting you do this, but it's just something that was really very, very special. The and the light, I understand that with a book, right? Yes. So, but what, what other things can we do uh, to celebrate South Burlington? So now we're going to talk about most people, when they think of the library, they think of the collections and reading spaces. So I'm going to go through and show you some examples of libraries. And this is a, a new library, but it's fairly traditional in terms of its layout, wood book shelving spaces to read, comfortable chairs, uh, great lighting, uh, things of that sort. This is a library in Norway. And to me, it's like being inside the whale. Mm -hmm. 
It has 26 ribs, and you can sit up here, or you can sit in there, and it's a way that they honor the book. So it becomes a very special place honoring knowledge in the written word. This is a library that's in a, a rural community that it becomes the third place, that you've, you've got home and you've got work or school and then you have the library that you can come to and you can have these comfortable seating areas. The rooms are formed by bookshelves uh, focusing on a, on a fireplace or other areas and it's broken down into small spaces. Uh, in this library, this is one of the Anythink libraries, where all the shelving in the center of the, of the room is low. So it's about 42 inches. We have seating areas within, and then we put the tall shelving around the perimeter. And so it's a very inviting way to come into the, uh, and find the books. This is a, uh, another Scandinavian library, where in this particular town, uh, their literacy rate was lower than what the community wanted to be known for. And so they created what they call the Mountain of Books. And so they created this, this library that when you walk into, you know what is there. And they put it in under a greenhouse, so it had plenty of daylight filtering through it. And their first criticism was, well, the daylight's going to destroy the books. And they said, well, we hope every book goes home sits on somebody's dinner table and has tomato soup spilled on it. We want them used. We don't want them here. And so that's what this community, their social statement was about the importance of their library. I think it's a very uh, interesting and dynamic um, expression. This is a contemporary library. This is a bookstore. It's one of the larger independent bookstores, but it has a very cozy quality to it. Is this what we're looking for here in South Burlington? Or are we looking for something that's more modern, more contemporary? This is a more contemporary-looking bookstore library, but it is a, it's, a, it's a library. But you can see that the books are stacked much like you might find them at Barnes & Noble. You can see the lighting is very inviting, and so they're retailing the books. They're trying to get you excited about coming into the library and seeing the books as you enter. Sometimes he's a little stubborn over here. But, uh, so bringing daylight into the library is also very important. And you can see again, this looks like going into Barnes & Noble with the stacks of books on the tables and, and offering them to readers coming in um, to use and to take home. Uh, this is a, a branch library in New York City. And they're retailing the books, much like you might find at a shoe store, where they're all on display. They're face out. They're very tall, so they're not necessarily accessible, but they're really reinforcing the idea of what the importance of books in their community. Not all shelving has to be linear. The standard library shelf is three feet long, and so here they're circular. They define spaces where people can read in the center between those. The idea is that people can go on a, on a discovery and really explore and have that experience of being in a space like this. Sometimes it's nice to find a book and quickly find a place to read. So just having sometimes seating within the stack, nice comfortable place. Having lots of daylight. I, we, when we talked to the staff today at the library, many of them talked about the idea of bringing natural light into the reading areas so that it becomes a very pleasant place. We have a wonderful natural environment. This is in San Diego at their public library, and they put the reading room at the very top floor. Most libraries reserve that for the administration or for books and things like that, but here, the penthouse, if you will, is for the public reading. The furniture is all portable enough that it can be moved around, and you can look out and see all the activities out into the bay. 
Uh, Petco Park is just a, a, about a block and a half away. So it's really a wonderful place that everybody gets to go to in San Diego at their library. Contrasting that, this is a small a library near um, Mesa Verde National Park where they wanted something that was quite quaint, quite warm. Uh, there's a, a, a rapidly flowing river that is just outside of that window. Um, one of the other nice things about this library is everything you see there was donated by the community. And, uh, and that became very special. As we started to design the library, the community really took ownership of building that, that library. Um, I like fireplaces in libraries. Uh, I've been accused of that, and I'll wear that honor. But we try and make the fireplaces uh, that, that part of that third place, you know, place for people to come and really enjoy where they're at. I'm gonna show you this fireplace in a little, a little later in the presentation, but note how big the hearth is there, um, and I'll come back to that. This is in southwestern Colorado. Um, a lot of people wanna go to the library for coffee and things of that sort. Those are sometimes tough to operate in a library because libraries generally don't open until 9 or 10, and a lot of people like to have coffee at 7 and 8 o'clock, and so it's really tough. But this particular library uh, does not have a barista. It has a vending machine. But it looks like it does. It has everything that goes with it. Uh, this happens to be in Arizona. But you can go there, read the morning newspaper, pick up periodicals. The furniture looks like is exactly what you would find in a Starbucks or a local coffee shop but it's, it's the library. Um, having window seats that look out to the outdoors, uh, this library happens to be near the quarry where all the stone for the Washington Monument came from. And we went there and they opened up the quarry for us and we brought a little bit of the stone into the library. Uh, not very movable tables here, but <laughs> it became important that this reference this history of the community would be in the library for many generations to experience. And we've talked a little bit here about uh, the red stones and things like that that might be here, a number of quarries. Are there things like that that we might be able to bring into the library, into these reading areas that can become very, very special? Okay, well, let's go and talk about technology and innovation, things that are happening in the library. And um, these are spaces that we're doing that are very flexible. This is called an idea lab. Uh, and you can see these are youngsters that are there during the day. There's adults there at night. Everybody's working off laptop. The furniture is very portable, can be moved around. And they're learning how to code in this particular space, which will be a very important um, skill set that these, these young children are going to take from there. We're finding that. Um, the service desk and circulation desk are getting smaller. Uh, we refer to the big ones as fort circulation because that separates the staff from the, the, the patron and, and we believe that there ought to be more engagement, more personal service. Uh, and so these things are actually very flexible. Um, this is a, a, a very portable one that's just uh, picked up and, and moved. This is at the Indianapolis Public Library. And uh, you can see it has a computer and it can just be uh, unplugged and moved around the library to help people as they go and try and discover uh, a book or a new experience within the library. Um, also, you know, the card catalogs are, are being more graphic on the computer touch screens, uh, things of that sort, so you don't have to go back to a centralized point to try and find out where your, your books are. Uh, having outlets for both power and data are important, and so incorporating furniture that offers all of that is very important. Um, we find this a lot at airports today, but we're finding it more important in, in, um, in libraries. Um, some libraries we go to, they have laptop checkout stations. So you put your library card in there and you get a laptop that you can use and wander around the library. 
Uh, if you don't return it, your library card uh, knows that you did not return it. But um, as I understand, um, this, this one uh, group uh, called Laptops Anywhere has never had, has, they've had one problem in the last five years with a, with a failure of a laptop. So it's very popular. The idea is it provides that portable opportunity to connect with technology as opposed to having the, the, the old la uh, desktop computers. And then these are quite nice in that maybe there's a lobby where uh, it can be a 24-7 library. So say you work late at night and you have a book that you want to hold at the library. You, you can't get there to pick it up in time. Well, the book is put here. You insert your card and it's dispensed to you. Um, so you can get access to this. Much like going into an ATM, uh, you can get books. And there are other opportunities where you could actually have a small collection here and you could pick out, just like going to the red box, uh, but this, is, uh, this one is for holds or for returning your books. Um, this is a library in, in Philadelphia where they have download stations. So you can go there on your portable devices and you can download books, movies, music, etc. Many libraries are doing that over the internet now. Obviously that takes a bit more time than, than being directly um, wired in, but uh, it's a very popular popular thing. This is the first bookless library in the country. It's in San Antonio. There are no books. It's all computers, all technology. And one of the interesting things about it is you can see many generations of people here, but it doesn't have the heart and the soul that going in and having those books associated. So in my opinion, it went a little too far. Um, one of the things that, that we did in a library is that historically you would have a couch in the children's area where a, a caregiver would read to a, a younger child. And so in this particular case, this library has a similar type thing with technology. So on the one side is a child uh, computer, on the other side is an adult computer on swivel monitors. And so we're trying to get that, that parenting or caregiving um, opportunity to siblings. Sometimes it allows uh, computing on the same uh, uh, program. Sometimes it's independent of one another, but you're together as a family unit. I saw this at a, at a bookstore when I was walking down the street one time, and I think it's uh, a good thing to remember. So you'll, you'll see me talk about technology and how great it is, and then we'll always come back and talk about how great it is to have that tactile or that, that specific experience. Sometimes, you know, having computers uh, built into columns uh, at different levels, stand-up computers, sit-down computers, um, and I think I'm going to have to wake him up a little bit here. Having uh, the ability to view musics and videos um, uh, in a very comfortable, innovative way. Um, these are very interesting seats in that there are surround speakers within this. And so somebody could be watching a video on this monitor here, have the sound way up, and I could be standing right here and I can hardly hear it. <coughs> so it's just a, a matter of of using the technology in an appropriate environment. Uh, this is the children's story time area in Indianapolis. So it's a large green screen. And the children sit here, sit on the floor, and then you can create really wonderful experiences of walking into Paris while you're in Indianapolis. Uh, another thing that we see a lot of is uh, books are being returned on material handling devices and then sorted uh, through automation as opposed to having a librarian do that. So we'll talk about some community and meeting rooms. So if you remember that fireplace that I talked about that had the big hearth, well this is it. So it becomes kind of a pop-up venue that we're actually doing a poetry reading here. And so it's a great opportunity to have 
uh, a space that isn't necessarily created for uh, performance, but it can be used for um, gathering of people to share uh, stories, et cetera. Um, many of the meeting rooms are uh, similar to this, where the tables are very portable on wheels. The seating is on wheels, focusing on a large screen. Um, we always like to suggest that whenever we have spaces for meetings, that they should be used all the time. And so this is a library where um, it does have a, 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 spa a meeting going on at this particular time. But when it's not, why can't the library be used for reading or for other purposes? So we have these large openings that are closed off with garage doors. So they're very simple, very uh, economical to create flexibility in the space of the library. Um, this is a uh, library in a city hall in Utah, and near uh, suburbs of Salt Lake. And this is where the seating pulls out or it folds back up. So it's like theater style seating, very comfortable in some respects. And so it can come out, be very flexible space. Uh, in fact, the uh, Vermont Public Radio, um, I guess it's Studio One, uh, has that same type of a feature and it's really a very, very nice uh, piece of flexibility. Um, I call this the Murphy stage <laughs> where uh, you know, sometimes stage per, uh, uh, large stages get in the way, so this one folds up into the wall uh, and goes out of sight. Um, this is a, a stage uh, in a library uh, in a city hall in um, the Netherlands where this raised area is used for musical performances and things like that, but it's also in the lobby of the building. So when you come in, if it's not a, a performance going on there, people like to sit up there because most people like to sit up high and do people watching. And so it's a great, a great opportunity. Or you can see there's a screen there, a piano, video screen, so all kinds of opportunity. But this is in the lobby of this library city hall as opposed to um, being a separate performance venue. Um, we worked on a, on a library where, uh, for the community room, they said they wanted everybody to know when the community is meeting, and so the community room is all glass. So they didn't want to be hidden behind closed doors, et cetera. When the meeting rooms were happening, they wanted everybody to come in and participate. Sometimes just having little alcoves for people to meet and to study is a, is a nice thing. Um, study rooms, uh, meeting spaces, are very in, much in demand in libraries today. Uh, whether it be for people starting a business, uh, working from home, uh, for groups that don't have a, you know, organizations that don't have a place to come. Uh, coming to the library is quite good, having them outfitted with the proper equipment um, making them very comfortable, uh, but most of the time we like to have glass uh, so they bring in daylight and you can see what's happening inside the room. Um, you have a very similar space at the new library uh, at the mall where it's a room within a room. This, this one is fully enclosed where the one you have at the mall is, is open, but it has that, that kind of quality to it where you're creating a special room. Uh, sometimes having, you know, um, a taller space is very popular with, with younger adults, or just having this is another kind of a study nook within the, the collection. Uh, we always look to other um, leading <laughs> technology or companies, corporate, corporations, to see how they do things. This is Google in, um, in Switzerland. And so we've shared this a couple of times in some of the libraries we work in, mountain communities. And so in Telluride, Colorado, we did a renovation of the library there, and they have two gondola gar cars in their library now as study rooms. Uh, and so it was, it was quite fascinating uh, to have that transformation, uh, how it brought a little bit of the community back in. Uh, this is a book, Igloo. You know, so spaces, you know, the, the the study rooms or the spaces don't always have to be what you typically would say, four walls 
and a door that can be something that can be very, very special and fun. Let's talk about outdoor spaces, and that's you know one thing I've heard a lot about um, in the importance here. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of property, uh, and so there's a park that's planned that's about a block away, and so maybe there's an ability to engage some of those things, but I'm gonna show you some things that happen on outdoor spaces. This is a library in uh, central Colorado where um, it has a rooftop outdoor deck, and from that outdoor door door deck, you can see the mountains in the, in the background, you're above it all. Uh, in most urban environments today, this is the most popular restaurant you could find, right? So why not do it at the library? Um, uh, sometimes having walls of glass that look out to a, a small outdoor porch. Um, this is a porch on a, on a library. Uh, we have um, uh, rocking chairs, much like they have at the airport here, uh, for people to sit. This happens to be a square dancing group that was square dancing in the parking lot of the library, and here they were taking a break. Uh, but during the rest of the time, this is a 24-7 library where uh, internet access is available. People can come under the porch and use their laptops and uh, get access to the library's collection. Um, we like the connection between the indoors and the outdoors. And so um, this is that city hall that I shared with you that has the movable seating, uh, this is that space and it has a connection to the outdoors. And it happens to be a large glass wall that opens up and connects to the outdoors. So it's like an airport uh, hangar door uh, out of glass that allows that connection between the indoors and the outdoors. And this is what that space looks like so they can have a lot of public events outside. Um, this library, um, we have a place for showing outdoor movies. We have an outdoor fireplace and we have an outdoor garden area. Um, and so that community took it on and they built a greenhouse and they started their own um, planting and, and, and uh, community garden. And I know we don't have space for that and I know you have I think it's in Wheeler Park, there's um, uh, community garden spaces and things like that. But the important thing here is in this community, uh, they really wanted to focus on nutrition. And so it's a real farm to table opportunity. So in the meeting room, we have a portable cooking unit that rolls out, that's self-contained, and they do cooking classes there every Wednesday and it's something that just has dramatically changed the library. In fact, this library was um, honored as the best small library in America uh, three years ago. Uh, and it was all because the community came together and decided that this is something that was important to their community, was having a better nutrition, better, better eating habits, et cetera. So they, they did as much as they could to reinforce those habits. Um, this is that same library where um, people are sitting out on a snowy day watching a movie. Uh, we have a little fire pit here as well. Um, this is in southwestern Colorado. So let's talk about children's area. And, uh, you know, having little special nooks for kids to read in. These are, these are portable on wheels. They can be moved around. Um, and having the empowerment of, of allowing a child to go in their own door <laughs> as opposed to a full-size door. And having special seating for the child, whether it be something that's a large plant, uh, so maybe it's Jack and the Beanstalk or something, but having childlike um, seating areas and things like that, having outdoor spaces with child-sized furniture. Um, we have a library that wanted to have a tree house uh, but it's, it's hard to make a treehouse accessible for all, and we had the danger of kids falling, so we put the treehouse down at the ground. Uh, we actually um, found a company that sells a bark, uh, and we clad these, these, these walls with, with, um, with bark from uh, North Carolina. Um, this is really one of my favorite spaces. Uh, this is in Salt Lake City uh, at their central library, and it's called Grandma's Attic. I don't think we have to explain too much more, right? 
It just feels like a very, very special place for the kids to go. And again, we start talking about giving these young people an experience that they're going to remember that's going to bring them to the library and, and, and attach them to it. You know, having craft spaces and things like that. Here we separated the noisy children's area from the rest of the library with colorful glass that allows the uh, adults, their parents, caregivers to be able to see that their child is safe. Uh, having areas where, again, they can be messy, uh, concrete floors, but having a craft area. Um, you know, interactive early literacy areas. This is a library in Ohio. It's interesting that uh, Jennifer showed us this library this morning as one of, one of her inspiring places. This is in Cuyahoga um, uh, County uh, outside of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, this is a, a library that we worked on uh, near Denver International Airport, and somebody suggested we uh, put an airplane cockpit in the, in the uh, air library, and we said, well, we can't do that. We can't afford it. It won't happen. And somebody said, well, I know somebody at United Airlines. They have a flight training center here, so let's call and see. Well, it just so happened timing was right, and they said, if you get a truck here in two weeks, the, light, the cockpit is yours. So there it is in the children's library. This is in a community where majority of the people in that community work or are affiliated with the airline industry. And so it's something that made it very, very special to that community. This is in the children's area. However, the adults are always <laughs> dominating it. So special to that. This is another great story. This is in Farmington, New Mexico. And this is the entry into a story time room. And a husband and wife gave this to their community. She, um, he was, she was a calligrapher, and he was a wood sculptor. And so they created this. And this is what the backside of it is. And you can see how wonderfully detailed it is. But most importantly, it is something those kids will remember forever and it will be that inspiration that will continue to bring them back to the library. But it was a gift from the community. It was something that was very, very special from the community. This is a, a storytelling room in Billings, Montana at their library. Um, and there's a skylight right above this seat. This is a, like a conical space. And this is the storyteller's chair. How magical is that? And at the right time, a ray of sun shines down on that person. So having, having a really special place to create memories. Well, let's talk about uh, teens and young adults um, and, and you know, brighter colors and um, more dynamic furniture and things of that sort. Um, this was a, uh, a teen library in um, Evanston, Illinois. Uh, they had a team a teen advisory committee get together, and they couldn't really decide what wallpaper to put up, so they used a little bit of a lot. But most importantly, they wanted to have something that reinforced collaboration. So we have these first two stations where um, the, the young children or the young adults are focusing on a computer. It's on a swivel base. Here we have collaboration of the spoken word, and we still have some individuality, some opportunities for teens to be themselves. So this was designed by the teens. And it became very, very special. A very popular uh, trend in, in teen libraries is this kind of booth seating from the 1950s, 60s diners, having uh, large graphic art on the walls. Um, I mentioned collaboration. And so having uh, tables that reinforce the idea of working together and that we're finding in the educational system that collaborative learning and working together is a very important concept. Um, this is a teen library in Ohio where it feels like you're almost in a sports bar of sorts. I mean, a large video screen, um, very casual opportunity to get together, backlighted uh, bookshelves and things like that. It's a very special place and a very cool place, I should say. Um, this is uh, in Billings, Montana, where the Teens actually designed their study spaces, so uh, they created these really kind of funky, funky study rooms. Um, this is another Google uh, environment. They're called the Beehives, which is a great place for 
for people to get together and be very creative. Um, many of the libraries we work in, there's a large homeschool population. And so we were approached by the young, young uh, adults and said, we don't have a place to put our art because we don't go to school. Let's have a place in the library. And so this, this sort of fabric, welded metal fabric was put together and they can hang their art and do their own shows. Um, a lot of young adults like this type of, of uh, gymnasium seating, if you will, bleacher seating, or soft seating to go with it so they can move things around but very flexible uh, opportunities and, and a little different than what you might find in other areas. So one other uh, very popular thing that I mentioned earlier was the maker space. And um, so a lot of our libraries have what we call the studios um, and they kind of reference this acronym here called HAMAGO, which means hang out, mess around and geek out. So it's for people of all levels uh, so if you just want to go in there and dabble at it for a little bit, or you want to start messing around, or if you're really, really very proficient, you can geek out. Uh, this is actually a maker space in a library. Looks like a wood shop when I was going to school, but it's actually a place where a lot of things are created in the library. Um, this is a uh, library that we did that this is what we call a clean maker space. So we have digital sewing machines, and so people can come together and, and make quilts and things of that sort. Uh, we like to put these rooms with large glass so you can see into them. So you're welcoming, welcomed into them as opposed to uh, behind closed doors so you can make a mess. That's in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. Um, at their library they call it the Bubbler. Um, sound recording studios. Uh, not only just for music as we see here but could be for oral histories of your family uh, or other things of that sort, a story corp, uh, or it could be for young kids to get together and have an opportunity uh, to record their own creation. Um, I showed the green screen in the Indianapolis Public Library children's area, but this is a very flexible green screen that's in a, um, a meeting room in a library, uh, so they don't have to be all that sophisticated to do uh, videos. and then. Uh, we're working on a couple of libraries in Montana where they said we wanted our makerspace to focus on the lost arts. And so the lost arts of candle making, soap making, um, uh, whittling, um, fabric, things of that sort. And so not every makerspace, not every creative space has to be about technology. It can be about something that's very, very important to your community. And so are there elements here in South Burlington? And if we want to expand it to the greater state of Vermont, but are there things that we could do in a makerspace if we were to have one that could be successfully done here? Let's talk, I think, uh, just a couple of more here. Um, we know that there will be a council chambers of some sort. And we just throw it out there that this is a library and, and city hall that we did in outside of Portland, Oregon, uh, where it has uh, the raised uh, dais and uh, for the council members and then very flexible seating. We've also done them where this is portable and goes uh, into a separate room and it becomes uh, a, a, a meeting space without having that raised uh, platform. Um, and you can see one of the other nice things about this is there's natural light coming into the room as opposed to a lot of these are closed boxes. Um, or they're more formal. Uh, this is in Santa Monica, California. So this is a more formal type of, of city council uh, type session. Um, or it could be more of an auditorium type uh, that maybe is used for other types of performances, but the seating is fixed, uh, but the acoustics and the lighting are all much like you would find in a, in a very large auditorium. Uh, or even another more flexible one that can be moved. So I think the last uh, item I wanted to talk about is sustainability. We had one client that said to him that means cheap to keep. <laughs> In other words, it's, it's low energy cost, low uh, operation cost, and things of that sort. And um, I know it's a very important initiative here, and uh, I know that Steve is 
talking about trying to make this a net zero building, if, if at all possible. Uh, but here we have you know, a uh, green roof with, with photovoltaic panels, uh, with a monitor that demonstrates uh, the, the performance of the various mechanical systems, a smart building kiosk inside, so everybody can see how the building is doing in different climates. Uh, this is a, a library where uh, all of this material in the ceiling is from dead trees that, uh, from a, 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 a bark disease uh, that took all the trees down in, in Colorado, and so we recycled it and put it into the building in a very creative fashion. It was just pine. Um, having these solar tubes are very efficient ways of bringing daylight into uh, interior spaces. Uh, or living walls are, are very important in buildings because they, uh, they off-gas a lot of really wonderful things, and it creates color and, and, uh, and gives life to a room. Uh, this is a library in Seattle, uh, the Bollard Library, where the entire library roof is planted. And uh, these are the solar tubes bringing the daylight down in. But one of the neat things is they actually have some um, wild habitat up there. And there's a camera uh, over here that then has a monitor in the children's area so they can watch uh, and see what's going on on the roof of the library. Um, community gardens, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but sometimes these are vertical gardens and are becoming uh, much, much more popular. Uh, and uh, perhaps it's something, since we don't have a lot of, of outdoor space, maybe it's something that we might want to might want to consider. Uh, obviously, photovoltaic is, is a great um, um, energy source. Uh, this is a small gesture that we did in one of our libraries where we provided covered parking for the bicycles. And I cannot tell you how many times that the people commented how much they were pleased that we did this because just getting the bikes out of the, out of the weather uh, was really important, and we were able to put the bikes, this kind of parking up closer to the front door than uh, we might normally do. So that's a very rapid tour. I went just a little bit longer than I had hoped, but those are the, the things that I wanted just to inspire you with. I'm not saying we're gonna do any of these or all of these, but I wanna hear, we wanna hear from you, and so that's why you have your notes. So are there any general questions? Just general. Yes, sir. Did you see any robotic librarians? <laughs> robotic librarians. You know, in research libraries, academic libraries, uh, the University of Chicago, as an example, has a, uh, I think it's seven stories below grade, a large vault of, of books and materials. And you can go to the desk, give them the number, and in, within five minutes, you'll have your, your books retrieved robotically. Very expensive. <laughs> I'm sorry? Uh, only in the transaction. Yeah. Yeah. So any other general questions? If not, what I'm going to ask you to do now, because this is I want you to put your, um, your slips up on the wall. If you don't know where something goes, we have a miscellaneous category. Uh, if you don't know where something goes, just put it up there and we'll figure it out. And what I want to try and do is read back the comments. And the reason I do this is because A, I want to honor everything that you've said, and B, sometimes when I come into a community, there are references to specific things that I may not fully understand. And so, it's important that, that we have that. And I'm going to have Steve and, and Tim uh, help read those back. Um, but, so don't leave, please. And we'll get through those very, very quickly. But it's a, it's, a, it's a good experience to hear what somebody over here was writing while you were thinking about robots and, uh, or whatever. So let's take a few minutes. I think we have some refreshments left, some uh, cider and cookies and all that kind of stuff. But let's put the notes up, and then we will read them back. So please don't leave. Thank you, everybody, for your comments. Uh, it's great to see a lot of 
post-it notes on these papers. Let's, uh, let's get started to look at them. One word to describe South Burlington. I see neighborhoods, awesome, entertaining, involved, growing, energetic, biking, spread out, nature, diverse, high energy. Uh, another one for growing and another one for growing and changing. Another one for diverse, uh, one for expensive. <laughs> Evolving. And then I'm going to move. Has everything you need uh, shopping, restaurants, sports facilities, hiking, biking, walking? I was going to say, I think I had to say one paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> These are great. These are great. Achieving community. Safe. Identityless, uh, between small town and urban area, familiar, anxious, conflicted, diverse, disparate, spread out, shopping mecca, not well connected, many separate places, safe, schools, a supportive community, a small town feel, a changing city, new and undefined. And I think I got shopping Mecca already, but if not, it's, you got it twice. I'm gonna move on to uh, where is your favorite place in South Burlington? Dorset Park, Whale Tales, which Dennis did not get the tour of Whale Tales yet. Uh, Wheeler Nature Park, Bike Paths, Recreation Path, East Woods, Overlook Park, another for Overlook Park, uh, Outdoors and Natural Parks, Wheeler, Red Rocks, Bike Paths, Dorset Street Corridor, Orchard School, Library, Centennial Woods, University Mall, uh, Tuttle Middle School, the Bike Path, Red Rocks, Neighborhood, uh, The Woods, many great public woods, another two here for Red Rocks, Overlook Park, another for Overlook, Clinger's Bakery. <laughs> Are they here? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, by the way. The school, uh, the energy of students, a bike path, uh, Stonehenge, the, uh, looks like a farm to Stonehenge, roof garden at the airport, South Village, uh, which is my neighborhood as well, Overlook Park, the library, Wheeler Park, Red Rocks, another vote for Klinger's Bakery. <laughs> I think that covers places. And if anybody thinks of any others, feel free to add. Uh, this next one is looking at things that should be continued uh, from existing spaces. The knitting group, uh, the librarians, <laughs> bookshelves, having lots of trees, uh, having fun seats, separate children's room, the farmer's market, being eco-friendly, the children's section, children's room, uh, always, always be welcome and learn, le uh, and learn to grow. A friendly place where library staff are help happy to help. Uh, concert space, uh, a highlight sections table of new topics and books, a children's area for story hours. Uh, and a, a bright array of books, study rooms. Um, likes, liked that it was attached to itself, I think. Colorful children's areas, an inviting space, uh, achieving community. 
and I think I missed one, a section of fairy tales in the children's section. And a, a learn, learn a new skill, place to learn a new skill. Uh, next on the list, what is one thing you can do in the library? Mentor, learn and research, learn something new, meet, teach kids, browse books for inspiration, teach my kids to love books, find a quiet space, relax and read, research special subjects, talk with friends and family, be curious, explore and discover, learn, discover the resources I need to realize my dreams, <coughs> access information, listen to a speaker, access consumer reports, research special subjects, check out a book, resource information, find a quiet space, research, use the computer, find books for pleasure reading, uh, place, uh, discover resources I need to realize my dreams, um, book groups and discussions, read newspapers, see friends, connect with new people, learn, wander, introduce young children to books, borrow books, a safe place to kill time without spending money. <laughs> That's perfect. Uh, borrow things besides books, such as tools, art supplies, sports equipment, useful, expensive software on computers. So using a shared model. Uh, welcoming to all in many cultures, check out books, and connect with people who live in the area. And another for borrowing books. I think that's, that's them. Let me continue this way. Uh, collections and reading <coughs> comments for those spaces. Uh, religious studies, graphic novels. Um, better, better genre separation mystery, science fiction, etc. Liz Kessler books, stacks of books on tables for browsing, places to stop and read as if at a cozy home. Uh, like the retailing look allows for recommendations by the staff. Uh, fantasy, fiction, realistic fiction, art and design, the doll people series, not cozy. Uh, like circular shelving, like beehives, easy readers, detective fiction, historical fiction, public reading space on top floor with a view, circular shelving that creates sitting reading spaces, uh, study spaces, tables and chairs in quiet locations. Uh, this is a little uh, sketchy drawing. I think it's a, it's a book igloo. I like that one. And uh, Norway, the sitting ribs. In the technology and innovation category, uh, robotic librarian, self-checkout 24-7, power outlets, idea lab, mobile staff kiosk to help with, uh, to help people, outlets, laptops anywhere, self-checkout, um, and this is a question, what's a green screen? It's, um, if you have a, a video screen for, the uh, best example is probably the weatherman. That person stands in front of a green screen to, uh, to show an image on a screen that's behind that person. Um, but the color in the wall is, is neutral and doesn't show up. Uh, touch screen catalogs, technology, uh, look up station, to locate books, self-checkout, virtual reality should be considered, a download station, uh, a tool loan, an automated checkout return, and an area for light therapy since our sun exposure is limited. <laughs> Outdoor spaces, a garden, a playground, a park, 
um, outdoor space, roof deck, rooftop deck, uh, outdoor movies in the school parking lot, a rooftop cafe that operates independently or cooperatively with the library. Skinny Pancake was a suggestion. Indoor and outdoor gathering space. Uh, like outdoor porches for lobby area to wait for public transit to pick up residents, but not in the best southern sunny location. Don't block all the natural light. Bike parking, a drive up book return so people can stay in their cars. Natural light, borrow tools and gardening equipment, gardens, covered parking for bikes, landscaping with uh, a suggestion for Winterberry. South Burlington residents will likely walk and bike to the center. Covered bike parking, a porch with comfy chairs, a garden such as a vertical garden, um, a screened porch is a necessity in Vermont. Uh, items from nature in the lab, in the library. Uh, let's see. Underhill has a Shakespearean garden, I believe, where the plants, uh, performances, Vegetable garden for food, natural light, I think I've covered. Uh, moving along to maker and creativity space. Art, technology and art, crafts, performance space, ways to incorporate the senior population, laptops uh, versus desktop computers, better. An art room, maker space in the building, uh, 3D printing, makerspace for all ages, homeschooling rooms, and download stations. Uh, in the children's section, something that's easily cleanable, a story hour reading pit, puzzles, comfy seating, separate from the main library, like the children's area, uh, Nook seating, child sized furniture, kids entrance, uh, the sound barrier so noise is not a problem. Uh, an art display area, separate kids room in the library. Uh, after school safe space and programming. Uh, keep kids separate. Kids doors, <coughs> dedicated kids space, children's craft areas. Couches or comfy chairs but no feet allowed. Shelves not too high so kids can reach them. Separate play area, rugs. Uh, likes the separation of noisy children's area from the quieter library spaces. Uh, senior reading to kids. Uh, the magical space for children and teens. Ageless experience, outdoor space, love the portable cooking space. Interactive children's area, interesting seating for story time. Support homeschooler with space and resources. Children's space with uh, places to explore um, uh, books. Place for children's learning. Um, I think this one is an uh, igloo made of, of uh, weeded books. So an igloo, the igloo space. Uh, magical space for children. Um, I already read that one actually. That's it for children's. Teens and adult spaces. Comfy furniture, a lounge room, a uh, teen space that they get to design. Improved literacy, uh, teens help the design again. Uh, lots of books, welcome and comforting for teens. Uh, walls of small study rooms covered with whiteboards. Teen area, chairs that allow sound, uh, but, oh, okay, the, uh, the pods or the, eggshell yep, eggshell chairs, uh, but that more than one person can fit in. I like that idea. Uh, collaboration areas, especially for teens. 
group games, activities, coding, uh, selective video games, chess boards, board games, whiteboards, chalkboards, covered walls, cover, you know, chalkboard covered walls in the study rooms, and tables and comfy chairs with good electronic access. Uh, community meeting rooms. Varied lighting and ceilings, portable furniture, Vermont products and furniture, coffee shop on the first floor that opens daily and stays late with hold lockers nearby. A reading room as a quiet space, natural light, um, uh, meeting room with technology, program space, meeting spaces, colored glass walls, swivel base to collaborate, art shows, solar tubes, uh, bookshelves like this with a little drawing. Uh, Pop-up gathering spaces, seating pulls out, Murphy stage. Uh, Pop-up space in the lobby, room for lounging. Book bags 24-7, tech in the meeting rooms and tech tables for small groups. A dedicated meeting room. Um, available by scheduling. Study rooms. Um, and meeting rooms, solar fireplace, double-sided, uh, so solar fireplace that's double-sided, cubbies, small group spaces, booths, glass garage doors, barn doors, perhaps, uh, like the community room that can be open to the library or closed off, the fireplace reading space that can be used for small gatherings, uh, fireplaces invite people in and create an atmosphere of warmth and, and sharing. Uh, an example, the Underhill Jericho Library. A uh, place to go that's not home. The third place. Lots of small meeting spaces for groups of 8 to 15 people. Space for performances. Space for playing card games. Uh, exercise. Group, group gatherings, I guess. Um, a fireplace, a community center area for food trucks during events. Coffee, retractable stadium seating. Uh, natural light, stage, Murphy style stage. The movable furniture and the fireplace. Play areas that are comfortable with the needs of senior citizens. One example of comfortable seating that you don't sink into too deep. Um, tables that fold in such a manner uh, for easy storage. A fireplace and views. Coffee, uh, great natural light, a, f a cozy fireplace and a place for art. Uh, lots of small meeting spaces, retractable stadium seating. And I think that's spaces. Next is council chambers. Uh, windows in the council room and as many uh, meeting rooms as possible. A lobby with a stage area, covered bike parking. Better civic engagement. Uh, I think this says minimize formality. Movable council table becomes seating. Very flexible, natural wood and South Burlington colors, uh, viewpoints, windows, and moving on to sustainability. There's a couple votes for roof garden. Build as a zero emission building, net zero, yes. Easy and comfortable access for people walking in from the street without cars, designed around people, not cars. Bike parking for more convenient uh, is more convenient than car parking. Think about EV charging. Uh, net zero energy would be great. Solar, net zero, we can do this. Provide bicycle storage. Versatile space, 100% use all the time. Green design, net zero, natural light. Lots of natural light and bike storage. Got miscellaneous. Miscellaneous, yeah. So we'll swing back over here and uh, miscellaneous category. <laughs> so we have a couple for natural light. Uh, use local artists. 
I like a library space that has a lot of natural light. Uh, again, lots of natural light, daylighting. Uh, bookmobile at the farmer's market. Interior gardens and walls. Split level, ground floor and mezzanine, so you can view over the main area. Capture the seasons of Vermont in different sections of the library. The green screen. Um, this one says, seems a shame to be in Vermont with little to no outdoor space. So think about how to get outdoor space. A craft area, a place to post community events, a place to gather and feel safe, comfortable seating, ample parking for bikes and cars, easy public transit, many defined areas, privacy, family orientation, uh, parking or good public transportation, links to, to make connections, um, central, uh, ample use of daylight, especially for reading areas, love the San Diego uh, penthouse reading room, identity challenged, that's kind of fits into the one word describes. Uh, daylight, yes, be able to see kids and other patrons easily across the room. A coffee bar, a reading nook with bookshelves. Uh, work by local artists. Natural wood. Use of natural materials, wood and stone. Easy access in the winter. Like the third place. Home, work, library, fireplace. Loves it. Uh, red rocks, stones, culture, use wood and Vermont granite, fireplaces, cozy welcoming place, library should focus on our connection to Lake Champlain, uh, include living walls and vertical gardens, uh, use of natural light, high back seating with power, Garage door meeting room walls, like alcoves and meeting spaces, small with a glass wall. Welcoming entrance with uh, bathrooms, window seats, fireplace, marble from a berry quarry. Able to easily find books looking for. Uh, handrails for older people, easy access. An area where teenage students can work together on projects with computer plugins. A place outside where people young or old can wait and be picked up, a covered area to protect them from the weather, a craft area, a place to post community events, a place to gather and feel safe, natural light, lots of light, uh, love the columns with multiple levels for laptops, uh, retractable bleachers and stage in the meeting room, uh, more than one area with couches, low shelving, a book dome, high back seating with power, garage door meeting room halls, uh, alcoves and meeting spaces. Uh, library should focus on our connection to Lake Champlain. I think I read that one already. Uh, cozy and welcoming, culture, fireplaces, a lot of good ideas. So we probably have, I'm guessing, well over 300 ideas. So um, that's really tremendous. Are there any, I know some of you have been writing while these were uh, being read back, so feel free to add to them. As I said, there's no um, fee or fine for late entries tonight. <laughs> and um, you know, ultimately we're gonna have something very similar posted on the website so that people can, can um, also look at these things. But, um, Make sure if you have other ideas, you communicate them uh, to us, to the library, or to the city, so that we can make sure that we incorporate as much as we can. Um, are there any questions? Yes. Um, I'm getting in on this, <coughs> excuse me, a little late, I guess, but this is on the half of an acre piece of property that we're speaking of all this? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and that includes parking? Yes. It, it, so, 
in a, in a world where we have lots of open space, yes, it's, it's going to be a challenge. But I think the concept behind this is it becomes more urban, becomes a city center, and uh, the zoning is that it be two to six stories in this area, not saying we're going to be six stories in height. Um, On-street parking is going to be available. And uh, do you want to talk about other parking aspects? or? Yeah, so we're See, we're you need to come over here and, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, or, otherwise, he'll start waving his arms again. So uh, we will be working with adjoining property owners, um, and we started some of those conversations to, uh, to make parking not just on street and underneath the building, but in other areas as well. So the library will be multi-story. Yeah. Go ahead. So, yeah. so these guys are not charged with the parking. They're really charged with the library and, and this particular site, um, and that will be part of um, what the city manager's office works on. So. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Well, I was just going to ask, is it free accessible parking? <laughs> it will be accessible. Today it will be free. Probably for the next several years it will be free. I cannot say as city center of all what choices that future residents and city councils will make. So, Yes. So I'm kind of getting a little bit nervous about the uh, look of the 20 teens, everywhere I look, there are these rather industrial looking buildings with wood and stainless steel. And I guess I don't want to become the glass brick, known for the glass bricks, you know, kind of thing. And, and I'm just real curious about how you go about making a distinctive building that isn't going to be just like every other building that seems to be going up all over town. Well, um, that, that's a great question and a great comment because when we come back, uh, we'll present some images of what the building may look like. This is a civic building, and so it should not look like every other building. It should have special qualities about it that draw you to it, that you realize that you're going to a very important building, whether you're going there for the city hall or you're going there for the library. Um, you know, sometimes as we go back and we think about um, the courthouses that were planned in the middle of the city and, and all the streets would come to them and they might focus on the front door or a bell tower or something of that sort. We need to discover that yet. And Steve and, and his cohorts uh, are going to be working very hard to understand. They, I mean, they live here in the town and so we're going to be working very, very hard to discover what is going to make it unique, but we don't want it to look like it belongs somewhere else. Uh, we don't want it to be something that is not representative of the town, and so that's why we ask these words about what what are your favorite places, what one word best describes you. So we don't want it to be like glass bricks. We want it to be timeless, so that in 20 years, 30 years, as as um, there's, there's a quote that I like, is the most sustainable building is the one that's most loved. And the one that's most loved is the one that we all were involved in the, the ownership of, of designing it and building it. But it's that one, you know, you, you know the one that's most loved, you know, whether it be the church or whether it be the city hall in some communities surrounding here. And so that's what we're going to be looking for is that identity because we want this building to be loved. Does that help? Okay. So, uh, well, exactly. <laughs> There's got to be a little bit of, of uh, counting on us. And, and uh, you know, I think the work that, that Steve's firm has done is, is just really exciting. I think Vermont Public Radio is a great reflection um, of, of Vermont, in my mind. Uh, and so we're going to be working very, very hard together in creating a building that's even more representative of South Burlington. Yes. Are these images going to be on the website? Uh, we're not going to have them all, but we're going to have as many as we can. Uh, we are doing this again on Saturday at 10 o'clock, I think. Is, it, is that right? Uh, yeah, 10 in the morning. 10 in the morning, right here. Yeah, not 10 at night. Uh, <coughs> and it's on YouTube. Uh, and it's on YouTube. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you get to hear the, the narrative as well. But uh, yeah, and if you again, if you have more comments or more thoughts, please put them forward. You, you behind, sir. Did you have that same? Uh, 
There, there may be people here who would love to see a stainless steel and glass building. Oh. <laughs> um, so we have an open mind. Yes. Well, that's good. We will, we will find that, that vocabulary of the building of materiality and, and what is really um, uniquely Vermont and South Burlington. And there's a lot of you know, great words that came out of the, the uh, comments that we got. So any other comments? Somebody asked me what the approximate cost is, or is there a budget, or where are we with? So if you look at the capital improvement program, which um, has been approved by the city council, that's essentially a look forward to, to estimate what we think this might cost given the program and information that we had at the time that we made that document. So it's a budget. You all know what a budget is. Things can change, but that's the number that we've been working with. Um, and so that number uh, is we have 12.5 million for the building, excluding all soft costs and land acquisition. Um, and, and I can't, I'm not sure what the combined number with everything, but if you look at the capital improvement program, it's the library plus the city hall pages. And you can see how it's broken out into soft costs and construction. We did not break out the land. I'm not sure, I think the land is represented under soft costs. Um, and then it also gives you our funding sources um, that we are um, either have in place or an are anticipating using. And, and that's on the city website um, underneath finance, department finance, and um, I think you can also find it on the city center website. So if there are no questions, I really appreciate you all coming tonight and putting your energy into it. and. Um, Again, if you have more ideas or more thoughts, keep them coming because we, we need more inspiration. Yes? So you're, meeting, you're having another meeting Saturday. Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. You're meeting with different groups. You met with the library staff. Yes. What is, once you have this done, what's the next step? Uh, as part of our schedule, uh, which I don't have in front of me to say exactly what the dates are, but um, we're going to be gathering feedback from stakeholders, uh, a couple of public sessions, today's and Saturday. Um, Hang on, right here. Got it. <laughs> okay. Uh, beyond that, we're going to begin, uh, you know, putting pencil to paper and starting the design of a minimum of three very different options. Uh, and these minimum of three options will be again presented to the public for their input. Um, so you'll have the opportunity to say, I, I do like something, I, I don't like something. Um, you know, we're really trying to listen to the public, uh, gather feedback, present ideas that we think represent those, ide those comments. Um, and then through that public session, working through the design February and into March, uh, the next public session is March, uh, and and beyond that, it will go to City Council after a decision is kind of made to which of the best options is available, um, and then uh, you know after a final selection is made, then design will progress, and the the city will have a chance to vote. When's the expected completion? Uh, Right now, the calendar shows a move-in date of uh, April in 2020. 2020. April 2020. 2020. And that includes about a year of construction. Well, thank you so much for coming tonight. Your ideas are tremendous. They'll be recorded and added to the next group. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody.